the law versus grace. You've heard me say before, there's two ways to look at God. Through the law, the Moses, Abraham, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the Old Testament, or the New Testament, where Jesus came to fulfill the to fulfill what, not to get rid of, but to fulfill the commitment. What is the point then? Oh, this version is by Eugene Peterson, who passed away back in 18, but he was a Presbyterian minister at Bel Air Presbyterian Church right out in Maryland and a college professor. So just to give you a little background on that. Verse 18, what is the point then of the law? The attached addendum. I didn't say that right, but add addendum, as you're adding on. It was a thoughtful addition to the original covenant promises made to Abraham. The purpose of the law was to keep a sinful people in the way of salvation until Christ, the descendant, came, inheriting the promises and distributing them to us. Obviously, this law was not a first-hand encounter with God. It was an arrangement by angelic messengers through a middleman, Moses. So a lot of times when we talk about the law, we're talking about what Moses wrote. But if there is a middleman, as there was at Sinai, then the people are not dealing directly with God, are they? But the original purpose is the direct blessing of God received by faith. If such is the case, is the law, then an anti-promise, a negative of God's will for us, not at all. Its purpose was to make obvious to everyone that we in ourselves out of right relationship with God and therefore to show us the futility of devising some religious system some religious system I'm going to say that two three times today forgetting by our own efforts what we can only get by waiting in faith for God to complete his promise for if any kind of rule keeping had power to create life in us we would certainly have gotten it by this time. You know, if, if we had to keep the system, if we kept all the rules and regulations, that would save us. But it didn't. So Jesus had to come. Verse 23. Until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic law, the wall, the wall, blah, blah, blah. the law was like those Greek tutors who, with which we are familiar, who escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, distraction, making sure the children will really get to the place they are set out for. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It's also involved dressing you in an adult faith <clears throat> wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. Right here it says, in Christ's family, verse 28 and 29. So in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew or non-Jew, Jew or Gentile, which we are, slave or free, Black or white, male or female, no one is better than others. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises, joint heirs with Christ. We are woven in with the Jews and took God's promise. Amen? Amen? So verse 18 through 21. I'll repeat that again. I wanted to read the NIV and then read this, but I don't want to throw too much at you. And it's, I find it easier to read the message, even the NIV sometimes. So it says, What is the point then of the law if Jesus came to abolish it? Like with the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, because they didn't like Jesus changing stuff. So what's the point of the law? The attached addendum. It was a thoughtful addition to the original covenant promises made to Abraham. The purpose of the law was to keep a sinful people 
in the way of salvation until Christ came. An inheritance given by a promise, being counted righteous, having faith in Jesus. But how do we receive the promise? By the law or by grace through faith in Christ? The law was only good to get our foot in the door. Like, I knew I could probably get my foot in the door through church. I was the leader of the youth group for a while, and then I led worship after my older brother and my mom led worship. And then after a few years, I heard a guy who was there, Jim Cutler, was pastor when I was in my late teens, early 20s, was leaving. I got a chance to get in there because I wanted to preach. So I got my foot in the door. We are to no longer live by the law, though. It was our foundation, our foundation of faith. But you don't live in the foundation of a house, do you? I mean, there might be some people that live in the basement. You know, maybe your long lost brother or something. But most people live upstairs. And even at Sarah's house, Marshall's house, the bedrooms are upstairs, right? You live, the living room's downstairs. So we don't live in the foundation. But now we live upstairs. We live by the promise that was actually given first. It was not that, because Jesus said, I came to fulfill, not, not to abolish. So it was what God gave them, and they heard it through Moses' interpretation, through Abraham's interpretation, and then they made it something else, not completely what God was intending. So it's not that we're to get rid of the Old Testament in all the ways, but we're not supposed to live by rules and regulations. See, we live by rules and regulations sometimes because it makes us feel more safe and secure. You, we know where the lines are. We know where black and white is, and we know what to do and what not to do. But he's wanting to, us to live by the Holy Spirit, by a relationship. And there are still do's and don'ts with that. There's things that will fly with my wife, and there's things that will not fly with my wife. She'll tell you. So we want to stay in right relationship. But God desires that, a relationship, not religion. Now, a lot of times we use the word as religion and we think it as a good thing. But religion means to bind up, not to set free. And Jesus came to set the captives free, to live in freedom, right? That's something we believe, right? We're Americans, right? Amen. Not a list of do's and don'ts but a friendship, a fellowship that we talked about last week, not regulations. God gave a promise to Abraham, and by extension, we live in that promise. We are the descendants. We are now woven into that promise. You see, the law, God says don't, not to be a cosmic killjoy, but for protection and provision. What did you tell your children and your grandchildren? Well, you want to provide for their future, right? So do you let, don't let them spend all their money now. You put a college fund in. You, wanna, you don't let them go out and touch things they shouldn't, like the hot stove or shoot guns or throw knives when they're young, too young, because you want to protect them. You want to provide a future for them. Moses and Abraham were imperfect men, but the Holy One of Israel is perfect. The law had limits, it could only do so much. It was good for its time, but it was temporary. It was a temporary fix. Guys who have done construction or ladies that have done construction before, sometimes you put duct tape on something, right? That's not supposed to last there forever. That's what my dad thinks, but it's supposed to be a temporary fix. It won't last forever. We're, so, we're called to do a life that is last forever, that's full and abundant. God has called us to have a life more abundantly, it says in John 10.10, 10, and to make righteous through faith in Christ Jesus, through faith, through mercy and love. Not by our works, not by stuff we do, but by what he has done for dying on the cross. Verse 22. I'll read 21 and 22. If such is the case, is the law then, it is an anti-promise, a negation of God's will for us. No, not really. Its purpose was to make obvious to everyone that we and ourselves out of right relationship with God. 
everyone that we are in, ourselves, a right relationship with God. And therefore, to show us the futility of devastating of this religious system, that the things that you do, for getting by on our own efforts. See, we're so used to doing that in the workplace, in school, and at home, and other people. There's a song, another Christian rock group I like, Audio Adrenaline, years ago, said, Sometimes I don't feel good. It's hard to start the day. It's hard to climb the obstacles that sometimes come my way. If I make it, I'm a good man. Am I a bad man if I fail? I know I'm never good enough, so I let grace prevail. It's only by his grace, it's only by his mercy that we make it anyways. We have to live in that. Yes, we still want to do that, but we think well, we have to live up to something. But if we truly get a grasp of God's love and mercy and grace and his compassion for us, we want to do those things. We don't want to stop doing those things. We want to do things that please his heart. We want to bless others. It's like saying it's better to give than to receive, right? Amen. You want to give. You want to bless. Faith promised in Christ. We are all guilty under the law. None of us is worthy. But together we are joint heirs in Christ. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of faith, we are counted righteous through his blood, not by our own efforts. God's plan was always to draw people unto himself. His plan was always to have us to live in the Garden of Eden, to live in paradise. But we couldn't fully grasp it. Verse 23 and 24. Until the time when we are more mature, enough to respond freely in faith to the living God. We are carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic Law. The law was like those Greek tutors with which we are familiar who escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, making sure the children will rely, will really get to the place they are set out for. In verse 23 and 24, I wrote babysitting. Sarah babysat. Any other babysitters in here? We had a babysitter. In other commentaries, it said a guardian. That was the law, the law under Moses, because we could not fully be trusted yet at home, right? We couldn't, kick our, we couldn't cook our own meal yet or bathe. I probably would have got in with my swimming trunks on. We're still growing up. But now that we have matured in faith, we are free in Christ. But as we know, if we know our American history, freedom does bring responsibilities. We can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater, right? We can't do anything that will hurt other people. You know, I'm not overly fond of this saying, but don't tread on me. Don't do anything that hurts your neighbor. You're free to do that, but you're not free from the responsibilities of whatever you do. But we are no longer, and I, I wrote this in big letters, locked up under the law. I have a thing I say to our cats, Panther, if you don't behave, I'm going to lock you up. You know, we're no longer locked up under the law. We're free in Christ. But that comes with responsibility. So it doesn't mean we don't do anything. It means we do stuff because we want to, because we love. The law and the guardian were insufficient. It wasn't enough. It was inadequate. It was a temporary placeholder. It was like a nanny taking care of a child for a set amount of time until they're grown. Verse 25 through 27. But now you have arrived at your destination. We are mature. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. There are no such levels in Christianity. We think we are maturing, but there's not all these things that we have to meet. Now, I hope I don't offend anybody. I don't like talking down about these people, but it, we're not the Church of Scientology. We're not auditing. We're not taking, we're not getting certain levels. Unity, verse 28, regardless of the law, no prejudice, no racism. Prejudice means, I love this definition, means preconceived opinion 
that is not based on reason or an actual experience. The power structure. In the past, a slave was supposed to be a dear brother. You know the book of Philemon in the Bible? It's written about a slave and the slave master in Christ. And men and women are on the same plane. But this wasn't the thing. See, Paul wrote this to the Galatian church. But at the time, women were just a little bit above slaves. They were like property almost. But Paul was way ahead of his time. A lot of times now, the Bible gets criticism for putting women down. But he was stretching then. He was doing everything he could to tell the people of that culture at that time that you're not supposed to treat other people badly. For if you are in Christ, you're woven into the promise. We can all be a part of God's family. That's a song we sing a lot, right? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. So in closing, it's time for all of us, if we're not already there, you and I to grow up big and strong, to get off the milk and onto solid food. We are the family of God, whether we're rich or we're the poor, Jew or Gentile, male or female, white or black. If you are Christ and you are my brother and sister, when you are cut, I bleed. When you bleed, I am cut. We are the family of God. We're supposed to do this thing together, live life together, share life together, be one, one for all and all for one. Amen? Amen. Yes. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for making us your children through faith. Help us to live in the freedom that you give us, not in the law, not in things that bind us up, but to have a firm foundation, but to live in your freedom and let our light so shine that people will see our good works and glorify you in heaven and want to come be part of it. Your promise, making us joint heirs with you, that we will share in your kingdom, share in your glory, that we will not just be servants, but you have called us friends. And show us how to live together in unity and harmony, to understand one another, to love one another, to sacrifice for one another. Even though that I have freedom, I give up part of my freedom for someone else to help them, that we're truly a family, that the older brother or older sister fills in for the parent when the parent is busy working and can take care of the younger brother and sisters. And the younger brother and sister, even though that, that's not their parent, that we go along and we obey for the unity of the family. Help us all to live in this unity and harmony. In, harmony. in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen. and amen.